All right, everybody, we're going to go through a real quick discussion of chapter 12. So make sure that you read it very closely. This is an important one. All right, so we're talking about resources. Remember our circular flow diagram and how we are at the top, um, not in the product market like usual, but instead down there in the resource market. So um, we're talking mostly about labor, right? So that, that's always going to be our focus, and, and we'll just kind of move along. Uh, labor as our examples. So read through the book and, and you'll get these sorts of ideas, okay? So remember that demand for resources is derived, meaning nobody wants, you know, nobody wants me in the way that they want a product. They want rather what I can do, which means that the productivity of the resource, my marginal product, what I'm able to do is going to be important. And of course, perhaps even more important is what I can do times what the market is willing to pay for it. That's going to be very important. So notice your definitions, the change in total revenue resulting from the unit change in the resource. So when you add one additional laborer, how much additional revenue is earned, right? That would be the, the, the most uh, common example. So we are going to produce or I shouldn't say produce, we are going to hire where MRP equals MRC. So the additional revenue earned by hiring a person against the additional cost incurred by hiring a person. Okay, so if I'm going to get hired for uh, $60 an hour, then I better produce $60 plus per hour. Okay, and if I can produce, say, $160 per hour, then they're not only going to hire me, but they're going to hire somebody else, right? Because the next person that they hire at $60 isn't going to produce the same $160. Maybe they'll produce $100, right, because of diminishing marginal returns. So they keep on hiring people until the point where your uh, MRC, which in most examples equals wage, is the same as your MRP. So here are your definitions. These definitions uh, should look pretty familiar because they are similar to what we saw in the product market. So change in total revenue over unit change in resource quantity and change in total resource cost over unit change in resource quantity. So very similar to what we've seen before. So here is an example of what this looks like graphed out. So we can see marginal product right here. So um, when we hire an additional unit of a resource, right, so maybe one additional hour for a worker or one additional worker or whatever, um, the first person that you hire, the first unit resource, produces seven. So our marginal product is seven as we move from zero to seven. Then the second one, six, as we move from seven to 13, et cetera, et cetera. Now we know that our product price is remaining constant at $2, so we must be in a purely competitive market. That's something that you're always going to have to check in all of our examples is notice the product price to find out if we're in a purely competitive market or a, an imperfectly competitive market. Um, okay, so then we take our product price and we multiply it by our marginal product, and that gives us our MRP, okay, uh, which is obviously going to be very important. So this, these two numbers equals this number. Multiply these two numbers for this number, et cetera, et cetera. Also, you're going to notice that demand equals MRP. So always very important in the resource market, the demand curve is the marginal revenue product curve. Here we see it in an imperfectly competitive market. You'll notice that it's imperfect because price is falling. Okay. So in order for this graph to work out, we'll notice that our MRP is falling a little bit more steeply because we're not only lowering our marginal product due to diminishing marginal returns, but we're also lowering our product price because that's what we have to do in order to get people to buy more stuff in an imperfectly competitive market, okay, in that imperfectly competitive market over here. Now, there are determinants of resource demand, okay? So just like there are determinants of supply and demand, there are determinants of resource demand. Okay, so a change in demand for the product. So if people want econ classes more than they used to, then the derived demand for econ teachers will be greater. Changes in productivity as well. So if I become a more productive teacher by gaining uh, you know, better teaching techniques or increasing something, then 
uh, you know, increasing uh, technology or whatever. Um, give everybody an iPad, everybody learns better, et cetera. Those are all options of things that would increase productivity. Additionally, we have changes in the price of a substitute resource. So if the Econobot 2000 becomes more expensive, then people are going to be less interested in buying the Econobot and more interested in hiring regular econ teachers. We call that the substitution effect. Okay, um, But there's also this other thing. So, so let's go to the example of, um, of so we're going to lower the price of iPads. Okay, um, and let's say that iPads allow um, allow more econ to be learned. Okay, so um, right now we use the say we use the perfect combination at Slu High of the combo of teachers and iPads. So when iPads become cheaper, we will spend more money on iPads. More kids will do stuff. More kids will have more uh, more apps and all that kind of jazz. So when iPads get cheaper, we'll invest more in iPads, meaning we invest a little bit less in teachers. So that's the substitution effect that we, that we just described. But there's also this output effect. It becomes cheaper to educate students in the way that we want to educate because iPads are cheaper, meaning we will then want to educate more students. Well, if we're educating more students, then we're going to have to hire more teachers. Okay, so the question is, what's bigger? The substitution effect, which decreases numbers, of, of labor, decreases quantity demanded for labor, or output effect, which increases. I think typically in most examples, you're going to find that the substitution effect is greater than the output effect. But what we're really interested in there is the net effect. All right? um, and then obviously we have changes in price of complementary resources, which works in a similar way. So here's some nice examples that you can go through at home. Um, here's some employment trends that you can look at, but not terribly important. Um, and then let's take a quick pause for resource demand. So I believe we left off talking about elasticity of resource demand. And what you'll notice here is the same situation that we had before, which was stuff over money. And you've got uh, your various determinants here, the ease of resource substitutability the elasticity of the product demand. So whatever it is the resource goes to, the product, the elasticity of that is going to impact the elasticity of demand for the resources because all resources are derived demand. And then finally, the ratio of the resource cost to the total cost. So if the resources are a major portion of the total cost of the product, then it's going to be more elastic. So you can take a further look there, but it seems uh, pretty closely related to what we discussed before. So um, just like before, we have an optimal combination of resources. So when we were talking about utility, we talked about the, the marginal utility of A over the price of A equaling the marginal utility of B over the price of B. And when these two were equal, then you had the optimal combination. Okay, um, and we're going to have very similar situations here. So the idea is that in the long run, all of our resource inputs are variable. We're going to want to choose the optimal combination, which will minimize the cost of producing a given output. Now, there's a different formula for maximizing profit. So let's take a look at those. So the least cost rule involves minimizing the cost of production for any given output. In order to do this, we know that the last dollar spent on each resource yields the same marginal product. So this is pretty much exactly the same thing that we saw uh, with the marginal utility that I just wrote up there last slide. The marginal product of labor, for example, but it could be any of the, um, any of the resources, labor, land, capital, entrepreneurship, whatever, divided by the price, as long as it equals the other thing, right? So this would be MPL and MPC over the price. So as long as those two are equal, then you're going to wind up producing at the least cost. Now the least cost is not necessarily going to be the most profitable. For the most profitable, instead of concentrating on marginal product, we're going to concentrate on marginal revenue product. Okay, so the MRP of labor over the price of labor and the MRP equals the MRP 
of capital over the price of capital, and that must equal one. So that relates to MRP equaling MRC as our profit maximizing output. Okay, although in this example it's less output depending on how you define output, but it would be probably more correct to say the profit maximizing level of resource employment or something like that. So same sort of example, if your MRP uh, of labor is 10 and your price of labor is 10, right? So you're paying $10 an hour and that last person is producing uh, $10 of marginal revenue product. And let's say your capital costs uh, $1,000. Uh, I'm sorry, your capital produces $1,000 in marginal revenue and costs you $1,000 over whatever unit of time, then both of those equal one, and we know that this is going to be your profit maximizing uh, rule of resource employment. Okay, so 10 over 10 is one, 1,000 over 1,000 is one, and we're equal to one, so we know we're all set. All right, so income distribution. Just remember, you know, this is uh, a little bit less oriented toward test questions and more toward understanding how economies work. So know that for the most part, we are paid according to the value of our service. Um, you've got workers and then you've got resource owners. And the two um, are, don't always have the same interests. Okay, so you could argue that in a certain sense, owners don't want to pay workers very much, but in another sense, they want their, their workers to be productive, right? So we know that they're always trying to balance increases in productivity Right, increases in marginal product, which gives you a higher MRP, which you're dividing over price. So um, you can, you know, decrease costs by either one, increasing MRP or decreasing resource price. So it's it's not fair to say that owners and workers are always in opposition to each other, though certainly sometimes people view it that way. Um, I think it's fair to say as well that we have that inequality can come because productive resources are unequally distributed. Some people are good at things uh, that are highly valued, some people are not. And this can lead to a lot of different market imperfections. These are some of those things that non-capitalist economies try to address. Um, so here we've got some illustrations. So what we're going to see is we take um, MRP. Uh, and we divide by cost, so MRP divided by the price of labor. And then we look over here, MRP and the price of labor. So we know that the quantity 3, which gives us an MRP of capital of 12, divided by 12, equals the MRP of labor, 8, divided by the price of labor, 8. So we're going to employ five labor resources and three capital resources. And you can kind of see how marginal product works. Now we could uh, try and do this with, um, with the least cost, right? So least cost doesn't work out quite as clean, but there we're looking at um, making marginal product equal for our least cost. So what we have here then is we would be around here as we move from 12 to 22, so then we would employ 2, right, because we've got 10 over 8 um, equaling 12 over 12, so that would be the closest that we could come, okay, without going over. So it would be, the least cost would be 2 and 3, but that would not be the most profitable. The most profitable would be 5 and 8, okay? Um, so the rest you can read through. These are just examples. They'll help you understand some things, but they're not specifically uh, going to be, be important. So take a quick read through the PowerPoint on your own time. And that is the end of Chapter 12.